seated. A warm welcome to everyone who has gathered for worship today. It is Canada Day, and so we celebrate in a way our freedom from the monarchy or the changing of loyalties or adjusting of loyalties, which gave Canada freedom to be and become who she was ordained to be. So as we gather for worship today, keep that thought and that reflection in mind on this Canada Day. For those who are new to the worship experience, most of the music is printed on the screen. But if you still want to do it the olden way, then go for it. It's the red hymnal or the spiral hymnal if you want to sing from the hymns, sing the hymns from the hymn book. Today we celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. And it is the most wonderful month of the year. I just want to say that. <laughs> An inherent bias. So we celebrate and we say happy birthday to Louise Lees, Keith Carson, Wonder Cressa, and myself. <laughs> And as is tradition, I tell you, celebrate the whole month, all of it, right up till the 31st, celebrate it. And I offer you this blessing. I bless the day that you were born. It was a good day. And the world is better for having you in it. And then we have some lovebirds who are celebrating their wedding anniversary this month. And we have Rob and Lori Cook, Ron and Linda Morby, Henry and Louise Lees, and Bob and Marion Patterson will bring up the end of the month. Happy anniversary to all of you. And I say to you, I bless the day of your union. It was a good day. At least I think you think so. And your patience and kindness towards each other is a testament to the rest of us that marriage can work. Welcome and let the grace of God fill your hearts today. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Our choral introit, Voices United 361, Small Things Count. stand for the call to worship. Let us sing of God's steadfast love. We will offer our praise in songs of joy. God's faithfulness is as vast as the heavens. We will proclaim God's faithfulness to all generations. Let us worship God in our prayers and our praise. We will give God's glory now and always. Let us acknowledge the land together. For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked on this land. 
Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. Today, we are gathered on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat nations, and we acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. We seek to live in respect, peace, and right relations with them as we live, work, and worship upon their traditional territory. We are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. Our gathering hymn is Voices United 600, When I Needed a Neighbor. be seated as we continue worship with prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, Lord God, how majestic is your name in all the earth, from north and south, from east and west, drawn by your majesty, we come to worship you. For the gift of this day, fresh from your hand, we rejoice. For the renewal we know through friendship with Christ, we praise you. For the Spirit's energy, blessing in each moment, we honor you, Lord God, loving God, all of life is your gift. So give us glimpses of your splendor and love in this time of worship. Accept our praise offered in word and action. Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit, here and everywhere, now and always. Lord of all life and each life, we confess we can forget that life is your gift, especially when we face struggles or feel disappointed. We often confuse our own desires for your will and stop listening for your guidance. Forgive any hurt we have caused by action or inaction and show us how to make amends. May we live with you and with each other in reconciling grace through the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The words of assurance are this, friends, Jesus knows we have fallen short of his intentions for us, but in his great mercy, he welcomes us back into his embrace. Thanks be to God that we are forgiven, refreshed, and restored for ministry by God's grace, amen. Or hymn of response, more voices, four, six, bless the Lord.
Let us pass the peace to each other. Turn to your neighbor, to your right, to your left, behind you, beside you, and wave at them the peace. Peace of the Lord be with you. Our seed of faith for today. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Seeds of Faith. I am Reverend Siddiqui. The seed for today is about God's family. What is a family? A family is a group of persons united by ties of marriage, blood, or adoption. So the family you are born into, you could say that is your family by blood. But family isn't always blood. Sometimes you can choose. It's the people in your life who want you in theirs, the ones who accept you for who you are, the ones who will do anything to see you smile, and the ones who love you no matter what. Galatians 3 verses 26 and 28 says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. That makes us family. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So what does Paul mean in Galatians 3? That through Jesus Christ, everyone is adopted into God's family. Everyone is accepted, even if they have a different heritage, different status, or different gender. So you and I are children of God, and the church is where God's family gather. We believe in Jesus together. We know we belong. We become better versions of ourselves. We behave well with others, and we help wherever there is a need. And what's different about God's family? In God's family, we should experience all the things we feel we are missing in our other family groups, such as love, acceptance, kindness, hospitality, forgiveness. We even get siblings and caregivers, aunties and uncles if we don't have them, grandparents, granduncles, fathers, mothers. So in God's family, we can actually meet our own needs for family. So here is the seed for this week. As followers of Jesus, we are all a part of God's family. God's family embraces everyone, no matter who they are and what other families they belong to. God's family is a growing family reaching out and welcoming everyone who wants to be a part of it. God's family includes everyone that wants to be involved. And in God's family, members show each other the love and care they have received from God. So remember, whoever you are, you are a part of God's family. Feel welcome. See you next week. Bye. As we prepare to listen to the reading from scripture, we will sing along to ancient words. Please stand.
reading from Romans 6, verses 12 to 23. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? But by no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our second is from Matthew 10, verses 40 to 42 from the Gospel. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Thanks be to God for the scripture. The choir will now offer their ministry, fill my cup.
Amen. Let us pray. God of wisdom, sometimes your word seems so clear to us, yet at other times it is a puzzle or a challenge. Send your Holy Spirit to guide us as we learn to listen to the scriptures today. Help us hear your word for our times and our lives. Through the grace of Christ, your living word. Amen. Today's scripture passage comes, one of them comes from the book of Romans, chapter 6, verses 12 to 23, presents us with a message about the transformative power of God's grace and the freedom we have in Christ, a freedom from the bondage or the enslavement to sin. To be a slave or to be enslaved is a terrible experience. Likewise, sin is a terrible state. To sin is to miss the mark, to wander from the path of right living, to violate divine law. To be enslaved to sin is to live a life where we cannot help but make unrighteous choices. We are, as, we are enslaved to anything that we submit to or, and allow our wills to be controlled by it. So if you can think of addiction as a way of describing what it feels like to be enslaved to sin, when we are addicted to something, after a while, it is the thing or the person that drives what we do. When we make a decision that we don't want to, but we still end up doing it. That is what, how it frames itself and for us to understand what it means to be enslaved to sin. It is such a significant issue that Paul himself lamented about his own battle with sin. In Romans 7 verse 15, he says, for I do not understand my own ways, for I do not do what I want. I keep finding myself doing the very thing that I hate to do. In this passage, Paul addresses the followers of Jesus in Rome, and he reminds them of their new identity in Christ and the calling to live as those who are enslaved by righteousness. Paul starts by urging the Roman believers to not let sin reign in their mortal bodies. As followers of Jesus, we have a responsibility to present ourselves to God as living sacrifices, surrendering our all to Jesus. All our hearts, all our souls, all our strength, all our minds. And because of what Jesus has done on the cross, we are no longer enslaved to sin, but have been set free by the power of God's grace. And since we are freed by grace, what should our freedom response be? I offer a three-stage response. First, we must acknowledge our position. Due to our identity as believers in Christ, we have been raised to a newness of life, freed from the power of sin, and therefore, we are called to recognize that sin should no longer have dominion over us because we are under grace. And grace is not just forgiveness. Grace is the empowering presence of God that enables us to live victoriously over sin. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, we are encouraged that we can be transformed into instruments of righteousness. And Paul poses the rhetorical question, asking if we should sin because we are under grace. And he answers a resounding no. Choosing sin over obedience is returning to a life of bondage we were freed from through Christ. 
And if we believe that we are free, we should avoid bondage at any cost, choosing righteousness, doing what is right over doing what is wrong. The call is to acknowledge our new position. You are free. Our new position comes with new responsibilities, with new privileges, and it is into a kingdom that has different values and different practices and different priorities. And to fully settle into this freedom that we have, we need to surrender to the one who issued us the invitation. We need to surrender to the one who freed us. So the second stage, after we've acknowledged our position as free, we have to surrender to God's authority. The apostle challenges us to yield our bodies as instruments of righteousness, presenting ourselves as living sacrifices to God. This is a conscious decision to submit every aspect of our lives to the Lordship of Christ, allowing Jesus' transforming grace to shape our thoughts, our words, and our actions. The freedom that we have received from the slavery to sin to the slavery to righteousness, that freedom is actually a change from one master to the next. It is a change of allegiance from one to another. It is a change of loyalties. But it is not a freedom to do as you like. It's not a freedom to do as you like. It is a freedom to choose. And the first choice we make is to surrender to God's, surrender, surrender to God's authority to surrender to God's authority. When I pledged my allegiance to become a Canadian citizen, I always said it was redundant for me because I already am a citizen in if my allegiances are to the Queen. Because that Jamaica is a member of the Commonwealth and therefore our pledge is to the same. So I just pledged to the Queen twice. But in order to be received into the kingdom as a full member of the family, I had to submit to the queen's authority. That is how freedom works. So by that submission, I am not free. I am free to move around as I like, but I'm not free to do as I like. I have submitted and surrendered to a different rule of law, a different process of being, a different way of interacting with people. So the next step to freedom is not to run rampant, <laughs> but it is actually to change and agree openly to being in, under and, on, in and under the authority of God. And that is the same principle for us as children of God. In Matthew 11, verses 28, Jesus says as much. Jesus says, come unto me who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. A yoke, those of us who are into farming knows, a yoke is that thing that you put over the animal that pulls the cart in the field. And so Jesus is saying, take off the yoke of sin that you have, and you're going to take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And then he says, my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. So when we become free, as in the freedom that Christ gives, it is really a change of loyalties from a life that is driven and directed and controlled by sin to a life that is driven and directed and controlled by God. By surrendering to Christ, we become servants of righteousness. 
empowered to live in obedience and holiness. But the freedom cannot be felt until we surrender to God's authority. And once we do, this freedom liberates us from the destructive cycle of sin and offers a life of purpose, of joy, and of eternal significance. So we've acknowledged our position, I'm free. We've surrendered to God's authority. And the last thing we need to do is to embrace our freedom. Through surrender, we experience through true freedom. Paul reassures us in verse 14 that sin will not have mastery over us, for we are no longer under the law, but under grace. And this grace empowers us to live transformed lives in which we bear the fruit of righteousness and reflect Jesus' character and love. And as we embrace our freedom in Christ, we become agents of God's grace, extending forgiveness, compassion, hospitality, and reconciliation to others. Our actions become an expression of gratitude and a witness to the transformative power of Christ in our lives. So what does embracing our freedom look like? Embracing our freedom involves four things that I list today. It involves cultivating a heart of hospitality, actively seeking opportunities to welcome others in our lives. It includes an active ta the active responsibility of embracing diversity. Hospitality knows no boundaries. It extends to people of all backgrounds, all cultures, and all social standing. To embrace our freedom involves being intentional about simple acts, engaging in acts of kindness, whether grand or small, knowing that God values and rewards our genuine efforts. To embrace our, our freedom involves seeking to bless others in practical ways, showing them love and showing them the compassion of Christ. The words of Paul in Romans 6 verses 12 and following remind us of the incredible privilege we have as followers of Jesus. We are no longer enslaved. We are set free by God's grace. So let us therefore present ourselves to God, acknowledging our position as servants of righteousness. Let us surrender to God's authority and embrace the freedom and power that Jesus has provided. We are set free and equipped to walk in righteousness. Let our daily experience be that of the joy of living this new life. May our lives bear fruit that glorifies God and testifies to the transforming work of his grace to a world in need. Let our freedom response be to take stock of where we are and acknowledge our position. Let our freedom response be to recognize whose we are, surrendering to God's authority. And let our freedom response be to embrace who we are, embracing the freedom we have received by God's grace. Amen.
Jesus teaches that the gift of a simple cup of water is a gift worthy of his disciples. Friends, whatever we give to God this day can bless the world in Jesus' name. So give with confidence that your gift matters. The ushers will wait on you and receive the offering as we sing Voices United 585, Jesus Bids Us Shine. Remain seated. Let us bless the gifts together. Generous God, what we return to you today has first come to us from you. Bless what we offer so that those in need may taste your abundance, which we know already. In Christ our living Lord, amen. Please be seated. Prayers of a people is a time where we lift up our concerns for our community, for each other, and we give thanks. We will sing Voices United 699, Live Into Hope. Let us pray. Lord God of heaven and earth, with joy and thanksgiving, we praise you for you create, sustain, and redeem all things, for making us in your image to love one another, 
and to care for your creation, we give you thanks. For the gift of your son, whose life is a pattern for our lives and learning, we give you thanks for the energy of your spirit to inspire us in times of challenge and change. We give you thanks. Strengthen us in these challenging times to show your love to others as we pray. For the church and those who lead it to find new ways of reaching out in a culture with changing values. For the creation that we may learn to reverence and care for it. For those who lead the nations of the world, that they may work for the well-being of the most vulnerable and seek peace together. For those who make decisions about health care, education, and social services in times when there are many demands in every area. For the poor, the hungry, and those struggling to find affordable housing when prices for everything seems to rise each day. For those who struggle with illness, addiction, disability, or despair, and for those who mourn the loss of someone dear. For the powerless and the oppressed, wherever they live, and for those who work to defend them. Hear us now as we pray for situations in our hearts to stay. In particular, we pray for Tom and his family and the passing of his cousin, Ted. We pray for Lori and Rob Cook, Lori has taken Rob to emerge, and so we're praying for solutions and healing. Eternal God, thank you for listening to us in every situation. Keep our eyes open for your spirit at work among us. Equip us to respond to someone else's prayer as your servants, for we offer ourselves to you in the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn, More Voices 138, My Love Colors Outside the Lines.
Just a reminder that next week, Sunday, we have church outside for our picnic and creation service. So please join us at the same time at 10 o'clock. Bring your chair, bring a lunch. We'll have light refreshments. And if you have a small instrument, also bring it so we can make a joyful noise together. Receive the blessing. Keep your eyes open as you walk in God's world. Alert for occasions to share God's love. And may the God who made us, the Christ who mends us, and the Spirit who gives us life walk with you each and every day. Amen. Our choral parting, Voices United 298, when you walk from here. Have a good week, everyone. <laughs> for the post-salute.